Okay, just letting people in and going live on Facebook. Hi, Tamara, how are you? Hi, you caught me eating jelly beans. <laughs> Your background is so beautiful, I love that. <laughs> Let me make sure I closed out Facebook so I'm not streaming, okay. Hi, everyone. Hello. How goes it? Look, everybody. <laughs> it's been a day, man. I had. Hey, wow, yes. Well, <laughs> I was in the tub soaking with some Dr. Tears, like, oh my goodness, I just need a minute. This yeah. And then I was like, oh, gotta get up and get dressed for this. <laughs> Listen. Yes, it's it's been that kind of day. I'm just, yeah. I was like, I need my ladies tonight. It's a good night for us to, good to night. get together. Yeah. Look, at least I got all my Christmas decorations down while I was watching the country burn to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> Insanity. All right. I was just trying to give it a couple more <sighs> seconds to see if anybody else is going to join. Look at this cute join. little puppy. Every Zoom I get on. He has to make his way. He's a mess. Well, don't be surprised if a cat doesn't launch himself into my lap. At some point. <laughs> That's hilarious. What's your dog's name? My this one, Zeusy. This is Zeus. Z e like Zeus, like the Greek god. <laughs> For this six pound furball. I need Big to see my boy Bentley. Bentley is elsewhere, laid out. Oh, this is the this is the shadow. <laughs> Tiny enough. OK, we will go in, ahead and get started. So welcome everyone tonight. Of course, we are discussing our December book of the month. The Sisters Are All Right by Tamara Winfrey Harris, who is so kind to join us tonight. We are so excited to have you with us. Um, this book went by too quickly for me. That's just how deep I was in it. And it was, for me, the timing was epic. Like, I feel like books just come, you read books at like the perfect time. And this was one of those for me. Um, you know, as Black women, we take so much on and just the pressure of everyday life. Hang on, some more people coming in. The pressures of everyday life and just reading this, I was escaping to um, San Juan, Puerto Rico because I was tired of everyone and everything. So reading this, I was just, I felt so justified in what I was doing because I just felt like it's the constant need of me to do this and, and this. And it's just like, we, we don't get any slack. Um, so I know that, that I was very appreciative of your book um, and it really, really spoke to me. And so thank you. Thank you for, for being here to discuss this with us. We are super excited. Thank you guys for your support and thank you for reading my book. No problem. Um, I know it had been on my TBR list for a while. I don't know, even Anna, maybe Anna and I had talked about this probably a year um, trying to fit this in at perfect timing. And I felt like the perfect time to do it was at the end of the year when we're getting ready to go into a new year and just kind of, it was good motivation and a good refresher for me personally. Oh more people coming in sorry this is cool for me that this is happening this week because I'm actually I'm off work this week and I'm working on finishing the manuscript for a second edition of sisters oh it will be out next fall that is so awesome look I'm so excited about that that is awesome so I guess my first question for you was I know you've written a lot of pieces had a lot of pieces published so where did you get the idea to come up with this and, and turn it into a book? Well, I always tell people that Steve Harvey pushed me over the edge <laughs> because a few years before the book came out, it just seemed like, you know, every headline about black women was negative. And like the biggest headline was, oh my God, why won't anybody marry black women? Why, how do we fix them? So somebody wants to marry them. But it was larger than that. It was, you know, why are they so broke? And why are they so fat and not healthy? Like it was always, you would think it was awful to be a black woman and it's not awful to be a black woman. Um, and initially the book, the proposal that I wrote was about black women in marriage. But as I kind of dug into 
the stereotypes that underpin sort of that discussion, really those same stereotypes underpin a lot of discussions about black women, you know, how we're seen by the government and how we're seen by employers and it's bigger than marriage. And so the book became bigger. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's constant coming at us. Um, especially, yeah, Steve Harvey's book. I, <laughs> it's sitting right God. over. Oh. He's my nemesis. He doesn't know it, but he is. <laughs> <laughs> and I can totally understand why just reading that book. And at first, like when I read it, I was coming from a totally different place, like newly divorced. And so I was kind of like, ah, but now that like, I'm past that and I'm kind of just this whole different person. I look at it like, mm, I don't know. Like, I just, I don't know how I feel about you and your book right now. I just. Well, it's this idea that's half sexism, right? But it also has like a heaping hump of, hunk of racism in it too, that women need to adjust themselves so they're worthy of being chosen instead of doing the choosing ourselves and knowing ourselves so that we find someone, if we want a partner, we find someone that fits with us. Right. Not that whole, pick me, pick me, because I meet X, Y, and Z. Right. Yeah. Like, let us be able to speak for ourselves as well. Because if your marriage is long, which I imagine you hope it will be, that's a long time to pretend to be somebody else. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that sounds miserable. And at this point in time, I don't have time for that. Like, yeah. <laughs> you either accept me, you know, as I am. Right. And that's it. Like, I, and it reminds me of a conversation I had with somebody today that I've like newly and that I'm getting to know. And I used a GIF. Now, if anybody knows me, I'm, I do social media for a living. I'm the most social person in the world. Like, that's just my personality. GIFs are funny to me and I use them all the time in chats. And like, I used one and he responded with like, I hate GIFs, LOL. So I'm like, oh, okay, it's a joke. But like literally had a whole conversation with me about the usage of gifts and how he didn't like it. And yeah, like just his face, <laughs> like, like a whole serious conversation. And I'm like, in a sense, I'm like, but that's who I am. Like, I can't explain it, but that's who I am. Like, you're telling me not to be expressed or express myself a certain way and to not be fun. like to me, that's funny. Like, I'm a funny person. And that's part of what makes me funny is using gifts at the right time and like People literally call me the gift queen. So like I it's for someone to say that they hate that and it's like, okay, so how do I I'm kind of like, okay, whatever. If you can't deal with it, then peace out. Cause how do you mold yourself to not that's a that's a huge part of me. It's like I really would have to think about it to not react to text message or, or in that way. So it was just mind blowing to me that I'm like it's a gift though. Like <laughs> it's really not that serious. Just roll right by it if it bothers you like I just I don't know how to yeah just as face for the day so why do you not like day. them yeah. That's so like much them. more to think about there his response was that he doesn't understand them that's um, that's exactly what I was gonna say because you can have a whole conversation through gifts but it yeah. takes some, some mental intellect to to get what, what you're trying to communicate through them and like, in like I'm getting defensive about it because I use them a lot too. No, and that's the thing, that's me too. And it's like in weeks of conversation, I've maybe used them four or five times. And like one instance was you said something and I rolled my eyes. Like, how do you not understand what that means? Like the emoji is, or the GIF is literally rolling its eyes. So I'm like, I, I don't know. He's but the old me probably would have tried to. Too. Yeah. And then it's like the old me probably would have tried to adapt and be like, okay. Like, but I had to be honest with myself that I'm like, this is who I am. I, I can't, I don't know how to communicate with you without like using that part of me. Like I don't, I, I don't. Yeah. So it was just weird. I, yeah. But with growth, I've learned like, this is who I am. You either accept it or you don't keep it moving. So. <laughs> March the 9th. Um, so overall thoughts, do you guys want to comment with your overall thoughts real quick before I dive deep in? I know for me, I loved it. Everybody's quiet. Come on, Keila. I see you pushing that button. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, as I was reading it, um, I read it and then I listened to some of it as well. I was just amazed at some of the points um, being made that we just over the years have kind of accepted as that's reality. Um, we've grown to see ourselves in this light because the media has says that, said it this way or that's how we depict it on TV. 
and we see it, but it, it just doesn't bother us anymore because we've seen it for so long. And I'm sitting there listening and I'm just like, yeah, we're not that way. And that makes absolute sense. And why am I just discovering this or realizing this? I've become so desensitized to it. So the book was very eye-opening for me. Um, we're going to see things a little differently in 2021 because of it. And I was going to say to follow up on that, the descriptions of Mammy, Sapphire, and Jezebel, like that made me realize how much society has shaped, like without even really thinking, it's just, it shaped me so much um, in how we're seen and how I see myself, even to the point of straightening hair for years. Like I went 32 years of my life not knowing my hair looked like this because I would permit all the time like since my I was a child my mom would perm my hair and then because of a freak accident I like had it bleach blonde dyed and I permed it and it broke off in the back but when it grew out it was like these spiral curls and I'm like what is this in my hair so ever since then like five years ago I've been you know natural but it's just funny how much I've like straightened my hair to fit in with society and have this image and this look and like I love my curls now and I wish like I kind of regret not knowing that these existed because I love them so much now it's just it's crazy how society kind of molds you to think that you need to look and be this way and even with body image like I'm finally at a point where I accept who I am with the curves and the you know I, I love that part of me but growing up you know I, I played a mostly white sport was surrounded by white girls all the time. So while they're super tiny and I've got these hips and this butt and I was in perfect shape um, and I would die to have that shape again, it's like I'm comparing myself to them and what I think I should look like when really I was perfectly fine the way I, I was, but society has kind of planted this thing in our head that we need to be a certain way. I, I will piggyback off of that. I, I just, went natural and well I had not been relaxing my hair for 10 years but I've been straightening it and the pandemic caused me to be like this gotta go because I just wore it slick back because the ends were straight and the top was I was like what is going on and so I chopped it all off in June but um but I grew up the same way just and I was known for my blue beautiful flowing straight hair you know like oh Jess's hair is always laid but it's not my hair. It is manipulated to look a certain way. And I went to, in preschool, I was, a, I was the only black child in my preschool. And I was having an identity crisis. And my parents had to, you know, teach me. I came home and said, I wanted to wash my hair every day. And my mom said, why? I was like, because Robin washes her hair every day and I want my hair, hair to look like her. And she's like, it's not gonna look like hers if we wash your hair every day. And so they sat down and had the conversation with me about how beautiful I was. I was different, but I was beautiful and I was a black girl. And, and so it came to fruition one day, we went to a parade from Louisiana. We have paraded any day. And uh, I think it was a Mardi Gras parade though. And I was with my dad and he said, he tells me the story. I kind of remember the, the parade. But he says, this older white woman said, oh my goodness, you're so pretty. Who are you here? To see? What are you here for? Whatever. And I said, oh, my friend is in the parade. And she said, oh, is she as pretty as you are? And I said, no, she's white. And my dad was like, it worked. How old were you? Huh? How old were you? I was like four. But they had taught me that I was, I was more beautiful than those girls in my school. And that I was more special than they were. And so I took that to heart. No, she's not as pretty as I am because she's white and I'm black. And my parents have told me that because I'm black, I'm prettier than all of them. And my dad said, all I can do is shrug. It's like, well, that's what I told her. Just repeat what I told her, you know, that's a cute from the story. mouths of babes. <laughs> but that was what it took for them to make me not have this complex because I look different than everybody else. And it just, it worked really well. Well, for him, That's but then, but then I straightened my hair for thirty-eight years. You know, yeah. Um, but That's a lovely story. <laughs> it is. It is. My daddy, my daddy said he was proud. <laughs> you can tell me straightened my hair. Um, I mean, but I have I'm mixed with Indian, so usually I I can get a relaxer once a year, 
And then the rest of the time I just go in and get it straightened. So during the pandemic, I used to go into a beauty shop and get it done. During the pandemic, I've been doing it myself. But still, I still have that where I have to have it straightened. For me to feel beautiful, I like my hair straight. Now, whether that's just because of the culture doing it or what, just for me, me personally, I love my hair straight. My daughter, on the other hand, she has gone to being natural. She's stopped putting relaxers in her hair and she's gone natural, which is great. That's, that, that's her prerogative, definitely. With some of this stuff though, I can't always say that I feel the same way or I've been treated that way. So I've, I don't feel like I've ever been racially profiled at all. Even at my job, my supervisor is a black man. My, um, his supervisor is a black man. So they also, they kind of look out for me and say, hey, you know, hey, this opportunity is coming, look out for that. So I don't have it to where they're against me at work, they're, they're actually trying to help me out and give me opportunities. And I have a, a mentor there that's a black woman that she's in a higher up position and she's looking out for me and saying, hey, you need to look at this or hey, you need to look at this kind of training. So I've never had that in the workplace to where I was discriminated against because I was black. So that's, you know, reading about that. And then, you know, I've always been so with my family, they already know if it's anything that has to do with racism, I don't want to watch it. I, I kept myself distanced from that kind of stuff. And just that's just the way I've always been. I mean, I'm, I'm the horror fanatic in my family. So I, I'd rather watch a horror movie than anything else anyways. But lately, I've been trying to open up and trying to read more um, Black authors, read more Black books, and just see what's, you know, read more about it and doing stuff. So that's why when I found this, I was like, okay, I'm gonna read it, I'm gonna listen. And I don't know, for me, I just feel like this pisses me off. Like, you know, yeah, I don't get it treated this way and everything, or I, or I, maybe I have never noticed that I got treated this way at all, but it just, how do you get past the pissed off point to where we can do some good with it? Like, it just pisses me off. Why would somebody just treat us this way just because we're black? Well, I think one of the things to point out and one of the reasons why I'm writing a second edition of this book is that, you know, many of us aren't treated that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a lot of ways, sexism and racism in the in the preface that I just wrote yesterday, I said, you know, misogynoir is kind of like water. It can change forms and it can creep into the cracks of things and rot a foundation and you don't even see it. You know, many of us are successful. I'm the vice president at a community <laughs> foundation. So I, I've gotten in my, in, in real life. <laughs> um, so I've gotten, I've gotten to that space because obviously along the way people have supported me and I've gotten an education and but you know why this is still relevant you know we're celebrating right now we will have our first black biracial woman as vice president in the White House and yeah. that woman has been accused of sleeping her way to the top like a Jezebel she's been attacked for the way she questions people in her job as a senator on the floor so a sapphire and nobody wanted a black woman as president. They didn't want Stacey Abrams, they didn't want Kamala Harris, but they sure were quick to say, we need a black woman as vice president to save the country from the white man that we chose. Yeah. So, you know, oh, while sorry. we're celebrating, you know, all of those things that we've achieved, like we're cheering for, oh my God, Stacey Abrams and Latasha Brown brought it home in Georgia. But how much grief has Stacey Abrams gotten because of the way she looks? And then this morning on Twitter, I saw people going, ooh, what does Stacey Abrams know about distrib distribution of um, the um, inoculations? The, you know, for, and I'm like, oh my God, the woman has to flip a whole state and now you want her like curing COVID? Damn, right. <laughs> can the black woman sit down? So, you know, even, even in our moments of triumph, there's this undercurrent of, you know, misogynoir and stereotype. And we will only be truly free when all of us, not just those of us who are successful and educated and middle class and thin and lighter skinned and all of those things can walk and be free. And, you know, not just a few of us, but all of us can. 
you know, just today somebody said in one of my group chats, and I think this book was on my mind, they said, wow, Stacey Abrams is a beast. And I said, no, 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 she's not a beast. She is a queen and an angel. Let's change that. She's not a beast. Right. She is a woman. She is a human being and she is divine. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I, I, I just even, just that, that word just struck me this morning. I was like, no, 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 she's not a beast. We're going to, I'm going to stop calling us beasts. And we are divine. We have amazing capabilities. A beast is a grunt, a, a, you know, a primal. This took an intellect and strategy. And so, I, and they were like, oh yeah, you're right. And I didn't, I didn't go into the preachy part of it, but I was like, no, no. Let's not call her that. Right. But can a sister get a foot rub? Like people are always, always <laughs> trying to figure out More what she do. can do for us. Right. What can else can she do? Get some flowers or can we send her to Aruba? Something. Can she take a nap? <laughs> right. <laughs> She's been working hard. Yeah. It's always like, what's next? Right. right. I even had someone, uh, a meme that pinned her as the, the next uh, Falcons head coach. And I was like, well, I ain't going to argue that. <laughs> Probably could use some help here in LA. <laughs> right. <laughs> she can make changes like this. Hey, there might be hope for the Falcons. So, hey. yeah. um, but Benita, I was going to come back to what you said about the workplace because at the time, I guess, because I was so young, like straight out of college working for the government, and I didn't realize that I was being profiled at the time, but I had a boss that every little thing I did was a problem. And I think at the time she was having problems with her marriage. Um, and so me being newly engaged, I'm about to go to the Dominican Republic to go get married. That really like hit her. Um, and so it's like everybody in the office would be free to do whatever they wanted. Um, the day, like two days before I was supposed to leave for my wedding, she gives me like assignments and I was literally working late hours till probably 7 p.m. I normally get off at four. I was in the office till 7 p.m. on a Friday trying to get it out because I knew that this was my last day at work. And it's like, you just gave me this assignment two weeks or two days ago and you knew I was going to be, this wedding isn't brand new. Like it's been planned for over a year and just things like that. Or um, when I would go to a doctor, I would have to show receipts. I would have to bring a doctor's note or a dentist's note to prove that I was there because she thought that I was trying to hunt for jobs. Um, but there was an admin that was also black of course she was older but she never had to bring in doctor's notes like she'd be at the doctor the eye doctor you know the dentist never had to bring notes just me so it was like you know until I finally called her out on it and my review it was like listen nobody else is getting this kind of treatment why are you you know but yeah I, that was my little experience that I had with the workplace and being profiled if anybody and it else also work the other way like, you know, how many, I know I have experienced being the competent one. You know, a friend of mine told a story about, you know, there was a, a, a speech that the, someone had written for the CEO of her organization and it wasn't right. And he brought it to her at four o'clock in the evening and said, I need this in the morning. I, this isn't good, but I know you'll, you know, I, I know you'll fix it. And she did, cause she's a badass and a great writer. But what happened to the white woman who just wrote this and was it was trash and she went home and now you're giving this to me and asking me to fix it um, at the end of the work day. So because they knew that she was competent, they put her in the mammy role of fixing things or, you know, leading things and making things work with fewer resources, you know? There's literally my job. Oh, oh sorry. I was going to say, I know at my job, somebody was calling me Olivia Pope. Oh, they thought that was, you know, <laughs> and I was like, uh, I don't wear a white jacket. That was the only thing I could come up with mm -hmm. because I was like, I'm not here to fix everything. You need to make sure you know how to do your job also. So, mm -hmm. and I feel like Olivia Pope, now that you're bringing her up, is kind of problematic too. I'm like, yeah, she's this superhero, but at the same time, she's the mistress of the president, the white president of the United States. So it was kind of like major side eyes for that one too. And I wasn't sleeping with anybody at work. Just clarify. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like, why can't you ever write a part with us where, you know, we can just be the superhero and not anything else. We don't have to be somebody's mistress or, you know, this is how she worked her way up was by 
being with him. It was yeah, problematic. Jess, were you going to say something? No, I was just saying exactly what y'all said. At my job, it's called put the Jess on it. <laughs> That's what they asked me to do, to put the Jess on it. Make it, make it right, make it good. But, 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 and you had another point of it. I think it might have been the newscaster. When I speak up for myself, it's a problem. You know, when, when, when I, I, I had to tell someone one time, you are raising two black female children, women children. You, you have to listen to what they're telling you. You cannot tell them that the way they feel is incorrect. Or it's not, oh, you're blowing it out of proportion. You have never been a black woman. You have no idea what I'm talking about. You need to listen to me and say, wow, I've never seen it like that or something to that effect. And until the incident that happened, happened to another black woman in the office, then they recognized it. And they came back and apologized to me and said, you know what, you're right. I was, I, I shouldn't have said that you were blowing this out of proportion because it's a pattern from this person that it was coming from. I wasn't, I was absolutely valid in feeling the way that I felt about it. And it took it happening, very same thing happening to another black woman for you to get it. But you should have gotten it when I said it to you because that's not your experience. So you can't tell me what is happening to me. You can't do that. You don't have the right to do that. And, and, what I, and why I brought his daughters into it was because if you do that to me, you'll do that to them. And you need to be corrected now. And it was the whole thing, you know, it was like, oh, no, you just blah, blah, blah. And then had to come back. And I was proud of him for coming back and apologizing. You know, I know this on Facebook Live, so I'm not going to say too much about it. But <laughs> it was, I mean, it was, it was a pattern of an older white person treating Black women a certain way. Yeah. Good so, for you for calling out, for calling well, out. I, did, I, I, I got, but then I, it's, yeah, you get so emotional. No, y'all get passionate. And I get passionate too. I'm not emotional. I'm passionate, just like you are. So why is that? So so why do we feel like, you know, in certain instances where we've kind of let stuff go by, like we don't speak up for ourselves, right? So you're in situations where you're like, well, um, I'll worry about it later. And then it happens again and you say it again. And then finally you get to the point where you speak up and you are, you know, passionate or you are, you know, just trying to express how you feel about the situation. But then, you know, it's like, you're aggressive, you're angry. Like, what, why is it that I have to be all of these negative things, but just yesterday, I, I'm the bomb, I'm the shit, I, I can do all of this. If you go, you know, you go to Sean and she can get it done. It's like, it's always the, you know, you, you just can't get it right. Like one one day you're this way and the next day you're something else, but you don't want to, you don't want to actually see me as a person as having feelings. Sean, can I interject here? Hi everyone, I'm Catrice. Hi. Um, I'm glad that you said that because what I've found in my experience, I am the only black teacher in my school, K-5, and I've been the only black teacher in that department for 15 years. Mm. what wow I am as a special ed teacher I am the one that they come to when there are parents who are suing the district I am the fixer like Christine said I am the one who's supposed to spend my days and nights on my personal time investigating lawsuit cases similar to that to then fix them to save the district millions of dollars I've had district specialists come to me after those meetings and say you did it again. You saved us millions of dollars again. Now go back in your box. So you go in that box. You are to stay in that box until we tell you that we're ready for you to come out. Mm -hmm. You come out. You do the job we want you to do. We give you temporary praise. And then we put you back in that box until we need you again. And don't do too much because then you look like you're showing out. <laughs> right. <laughs> then another thing was I experienced last year because last year was a really hard case. I had never gotten emotional ever at work, but I think my body just needed that release because it was beginning to become overwhelmed. But when I had that emotional release, it was, oh, you're just emotional. 
you get past it, you can still keep doing it. But my white colleagues, when they get emotional, because they always are emotional, it's just, oh, maybe we shouldn't give it to her because she can't handle it. And there was a, a part in the book that I noted about that is that the white woman is seen as soft and too delicate for hard manual labor, where it's like us, we're, we're the workhorses that just constant, just given us from the beginning. It's just, they've always seen us as being able to take on mm -hmm. this great load. And it's exhausting. When, my, when I cried last year, when I had that release, my white teammate said, but you're not supposed to cry because you're so strong. I said, but you do the same. And she says, but I'm weaker than you. Like, I just thought that it was interesting that wow. she stated that. Wow. Said, but you're not weaker than me. It's just that I finally have had enough after 15 years of being the fixer. You all cry just because it's your way to get out of even having to even start to do this. White tears. Yes. Oh. But I just thought it was interesting that she made the comment in my face. But you're so strong. No, I don't want to be strong. I don't want to be perceived as the strong one. I can't believe it. They've always that. felt that way about us. Back in the day, slavery, we could have the baby and a couple of days later, you're out in the field working field again. Working. Yeah. So it's yeah. just, it's the modern version of just pick that cotton, do your job mm -hmm. and be, and shut up. Yeah. You know, it's not yeah. about shining. It's not about mm -hmm. being rewarded for your work. Just do this thing we gave you to do. Mm -hmm. And go back in that box. Yeah. Stay in your lane. <laughs> And it's not even just doing your job, like you're doing the job of the person beside you, the person behind you, your boss's boss, you're doing the job of most people. Oh, that is your job. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. Oh, that is your job, right? <laughs> <laughs> that statistic that you had in there too was was shamefully eye-opening to me that we are the most participatory in the workplace. Because we, the stereotype that you get is that we're sitting around cackling with each other, <laughs> you know, but or, or taking long lunches or, or you know, whatever. But that, that I went, I shame on me that I didn't think that because it is true. <laughs> I mean, but it, how, how can we be doing that when everybody is looking at us? Right. How long class? Right. <laughs> but the minute the minute right. we do, the minute we do, like you said, you got to send in a. The, the doctor's excuse when you take when you go to the doctor or you have to prove you know whatever it is like you constantly trying to prove ourselves mm -hmm. and, and like you were talking about the strong part I had to do that tell a friend recently you don't have to tell me that you can tell me you are not okay I'm your friend like you she she had a baby recently and she was like, it's a lot, you know, she was like, but I'm okay. But, 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 but it's, it's fine. I was like, it's not fine. That's why you call me. You can, you can tell me it's not fine. There's no judgment coming from me. It's okay for you to say you're overwhelmed, you know, Honestly, <laughs> we do that to ourselves. Yeah. 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 More people like you that will actually say that, like, it's okay to not be okay. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I don't think many people know that they have those outlets to like reach out and you know for me as a single mom raising five month old twins by myself like that oh my gosh that was just a lot but I don't like people ask me like how do you do it and I really cannot I don't know I don't know how I made it through that time period I, I really strong. <laughs> well that's the thing and it, it reminds me I have a college teammate who is a white woman and her husband is deployed and poor her, she's a Facebook rant that she has to do this all by herself because her husband's deployed and all this and that. And I'm like, please spare <laughs> right now. Like, you know what I mean? In a sense, like that's a choice. He chose to go that route with his career. It's like, y'all chose to have a baby at this time. Y'all chose to make this. I didn't choose for my husband to walk out on me and leave me with two five month old babies. Like that's, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, I'm not complaining at all, but here you are on your Facebook post complaining about your husband being deployed with one, one baby. Like, you'll be okay. Trust me. <laughs> Just but, you know, the, the, the ways that we don't say that we're not okay and that we've been taught to not say that we're okay and that we don't sometimes support each other and not being okay causes generational trauma. Like, you know, I've been saying that if we want to heal the Black community, you need to start with Black women. 
Because if we're not okay, nobody is okay. Who's who's raising all of the children? Who's leading most of the households? It's us. Right. And so if we're unsupported, the story that sticks in my head is the one, I think it's in the health chapter of um, the woman, Deborah, whose friend had 2000 hours of sick time that she refused to take, even when she was doubled over in pain and it, and it ended up that she had terminal cancer. But I mean, there are lots of stories like that um, about our inability to stop because we think everybody needs us. And we just keep passing that idea on I interview, that's part of the reason why I wanted my next book to be directed at black girls. I interviewed a black girl and a mother and you know, the girl had suffered with depression. She had tried um, and suicidal ideation. She tried to kill herself twice. And you know, the thing she kept complaining about was that her mother was like, you just need to toughen up. You just, I mean, I, you know, our kids don't do that. Like you hanging around too many white kids, what are you doing? And the more I talk to the mom, she's like, when do I have time to break down? She's like, you know, my mother was, my mother was dying. I was driving up and down the road trying to, de you know, care for my dying mom in one city. I've, I'm raising a child alone. Um, you know, she's having problems. I'm working, like she, she worked in corrections. She's like manager there and she has no way to break down and no soft place to land. And so she couldn't provide that for her daughter who's the next generation. So like if, if we don't fix it, cause no, people will keep giving us stuff to do and keep putting more on our shoulders. But if we don't fix it, we're gonna doom future generations. Yeah. And it's funny cause I have an instance where like I, I do Booker Magic, I work a full-time job. You know, and I also coach my daughter's softball team. So the head coach, I'm like his right-hand woman. I play college softball like I'm his go-to when he has questions about anything. Like, that's just what it is. Um, but even his wife will text me and be like, hey, Jamie needs help with the uniforms. Can you help him? I'm like, that's your husband, though. You know what I'm saying? You're asking, which is fine because I get it. This is my realm. Like, I get it. But then, like, last week, I told y'all I escaped to San Juan for a few days and I literally went cold turkey on everybody, probably except for Jess on here. But like, I wasn't texting anybody. I wasn't responding to texts. And it was just like this concern of like, where's Renee? What's going on? You're quiet. Like, why are I wasn't myself. So, you know, in the group chats, I wasn't responding. But I'm like, there's also another mom who's going through some stuff. But of course, she's white and not responding. But the concern is not like there like it is when Ren what's wrong with Renee? I'm like... I just need time. Like, just give me five yeah. minutes to just collect myself. It's like, I'm, I've got many hats that I wear and it's just like, I just need a break from everything or else I'm going to combust. <laughs> but it's just like, you what know. What's happening, we are told our, our team uh, that What's President that? Trump rebuffed Where's efforts. That from? No. Now, I was going to say that um, I agree with everything that you guys said. One of the things I decided this year was I was going back to my Franklin Planner book, you know, my planner. And in there, it told you to create like your roles and then you had to do something for yourself every week. Hmm. And I had something in there like if I knew it was going to be a high level week, what I needed to do, like take a nap, go for a walk, just to make sure I was back on track. So reading this book reminded me I took off two weeks for Christmas break. So I'm sure all of y'all are back at work this week. I'm still at home. Well, oh, we're nice. <laughs> but I'm off this week. And so everybody always says to me, well, why do you take off the first week of the year? And I said, that's because that's when everybody else comes back and they're crazy. Yeah. So when I go back next week, I'm calm, you know, and relaxed. Whereas everybody else is like, oh, can you do this? So, I mean, but I realized when I was doing that with my Franklin Planner, I had a much more relaxed week because I knew what were my big rocks and what were my little rocks. And now that I'm an empty nester, I have more time, but I don't tell nobody. I block off that time. So. <laughs> but it, it helps. But I, I don't know how I did all the stuff I did when I was younger. I know somebody was praying for me um, because even though I had one child... I was going to grad school, I was pledging, and I was doing some other stuff 
and running him around to his five different activities. So as I look back on those times and I just think, what was wrong with you? Yeah. But I'm glad that I'm over that. So I'm in recovery. So thank you for the book. It made me realize that I can recover. <laughs> Amen. And I also think that, you know, a lot of people looked at 2020 as like this God awful year. But for me, it was a blessing. Like I get to work at, from home every day since March 13th. I've been at home. Like yeah. my mental state is so good because I can just roll out of bed, jump on my Peloton workout. And it's still quiet when I'm done. My boss doesn't get on until nine o'clock. So it's like not having to, I used to start work at 6.30, like be in the office at 6.30. So can you imagine waking up at four, waking up twins, dropping them off at daycare, being at work at 6.30? Like that's a lot to cram in there. So I think for my mental state, this pandemic has done wonders. Um, and I think it's also going to change our workplace and how we approach things going forward. Like, I think they're going to continue to let us telework a couple days a week. I mean, because we're proving that we're capable of doing it. We don't need to be in the office every day. So even just not having to commute 40 minutes one way um, each and every day has done wonders to be able to spend more time with my kids like this. I never want to go back if I'm being honest. Like, I just want to telework forever if I can. Uh, yeah, so it's it's been it's done wonders, but it's really opened my eyes to like take care of self mm -hmm. um, first and foremost. Yeah. yeah, I feel like they get way more out of me because <laughs> I can do things when I need to do them. Because when I leave, I'm gone because I have not been here all day. But when I'm here all day, you get me from sun up to sun down. Absolutely. You know, I mean, it, it just makes for a better, and I'm not exhausted. I mean, I'm tired, but I'm, I am still drained because my job has been crazy even during the pandemic. But and, and I'm doing more than we were doing before, and I'm doing it from home. And it's, and it's working. It's okay. And I can take, like Renee said, we both have a Peloton. I can do a ride at 10 o'clock, get back on the computer at 1030 and keep doing my work because I don't have to get up at five to be at the gym and then have to sit and let my hair dry because my hair was still straight. <laughs> and so I did, if I didn't get to the gym by five o'clock, I wasn't going because it was too much now. It's like, life is easy. <laughs> and I think that for me, like exercise has been a major outlet for me during this pandemic. But waking up at four o'clock in the morning or having kids softball schedules and basketball, it's like I'm always constantly doing for them. And trying to fit everything else in so it's nice to like have that me time to just be able to get myself together before I start my day without interruptions so yeah I mean definitely like I have an hour probably about an hour hour and a half commute every day going going one way so um my husband and I carpool which is very helpful because I sleep on the way to work so <laughs> I, the it, life that's awesome for, so, but yeah, it, it definitely, I, I would love to sit here and work from home every day. And then this also got us to slow down. My husband and I, our kids are all grown. The youngest one is 21. So we are at the point where we were just always going. We, my husband's from a big family. I have a big family. So we're always constantly doing something. Somebody's wedding, somebody's birthday, somebody's something. So when the pandemic hit, it was like, whoo, wait a minute. We can't go anywhere. Um, I'm actually a high risk patient, a high risk person because I have a, a blood disorder. So it was like, okay, my husband's like, yeah, we're not going. So well, so and so's happening. He said, nope, we're not going nowhere. We're going to stay right here at home. And that that got us to slow down because it was like every weekend it was like, oh, oh man. He was like, oh, if, and if it wasn't in the and our way of doing things was it's not in the calendar, it's not happening. So if somebody called and said, hey, we got a party. Is it if he didn't put it in the calendar? I didn't put it in the calendar. Hey, if we had something that somebody else already invited us to something else, then whoever was in the calendar is the one that we're going to attend, unless it was you know a really 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 close family member that we said, oh yeah, we got to go to that. But it, it got us to slow down though. So I mean, yeah, we haven't been anywhere. We've been invited to several different places now, but we're like, my husband's like, nope, you know, Benita, she can't she can't be around people, so we can't go. So. I love that because I feel like I'm constantly trying to be there for everybody and be in all these places and it's okay to say no because you know you stretch yourself so thin trying to be at this person's place or this event and I love that that if it's not already pre-planned in the calendar 
because I'll accept stuff. And then after about, you know, a day or so, I'm like, why did I do that? I don't feel like doing that. I just want to stay at home. I'm so bad at that. But yeah, that's a great idea to do that. Any other general questions or thoughts about the book? Anybody wants to give? Nope. So you you talked earlier about working on another edition. What is going to be different or can you kind of tell us what we can expect from the, the new edition? So I feel a lot feels, a lot has changed in the five years you know, since this book came out. Um, and, you know, part of it is just going through and updating some of the cultural references, some of the things that are happening. But for instance, in the motherhood chapter, I want to talk about infant, Black infant maternal mortality, um, because that's another example of how people don't value us as mothers. You think of what happened to Serena Williams in 2017, and what happens to many of us every day, um, during our birth experiences. Um, I'm adding a chapter on politics because, oh, right. <laughs> you know, and, and how stereotype works there. I also want to rewrite the, the chapter on sex because I think, um, you know, I'm hearing that women who are perhaps younger than us in their 20s and, you know, are having a different experience you know, where many of, many of us were told, just don't do it. Um, many of them are getting, like there's this, this weird hypocritical message where everything on social media is, you be hypersexual, look sexy, but don't have sex or, or but do, you can talk about your sexual prowess, but not with too many people. Like they have like an even thinner line that they have to walk. And so I want to add in some of that. I want to talk about the rise of the Black beauty aesthetic because there's Fenty now, and but then there's also Black fishing. Khloe Kardashian has Beyonce's face, and I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> and there, there's this rash of white women pretending to be Black women and wanting everything but the burden. Um, so I'm going to work some of those things in. So it'll be an expanded second edition. I love that. I'm excited for that. And then I'd love, like, if, you know, before we wrap up, I would love to read one of the letters from my next book that is yes. coming out. And that was actually my last, my next question for you. Awesome. Is I wanted you to kind of talk about your upcoming book and tell us a little bit about it. And sure, yeah, we'd love to hear something. So, so actually, the, like, the seeds for this book were planted as I was um, going around and promoting sisters. I was actually coming from a book event like this one when we could leave the house <laughs> in Detroit. Um, and my publicist, publicist and I, she's a Black woman, realized that as we were talking about stereotype in Black women, a lot of times in the conversations, everyone would agree that, okay, we're all right, women in their like 40s, 30s, 50s, but those younger women, like, you know, you start talking about younger women and everyone was like, no, they need Jesus. Like some of the same stereotypes that we rejected for ourselves we were very quick to put on younger women. Um, and I realized that we don't always come to our relationships, intergenerational relationships with vulnerability. You know, sometimes we come with fear and with anger because we're scared for other women because we know what happens when you stumble. Um, and what if there were a way um, to, to give black women an opportunity to talk to other generations and come to them with love and come to them with vulnerability. So I was doing a workshop with two of my dear friends and I had this idea to um, get a letter from a black woman for each of the girls that were part of the workshop. And I asked for 12, I just went on social media and asked for 12 and I ended up getting 50 wow. from around the world. And they were so amazing. Um, and I'm going to read the first one I received for you that made me want to continue to do this, continue collecting letters for Black girls. But this book is a collection of letters on a variety of topics, identity, how to become a good friend, um, how do you balance your work and passions, um, advice, um, how do you deal with tough things like 
sexual assault and teenage pregnancy, just the gamut of things, Black women talking about their experiences and writing lovingly to Black girls wrapped in my analysis. Um, it will be out on March 9th, but it's available for pre-order now, and I'll, I'll happily drop a link in the chat. But I thought I would read, let's see which glasses I need. I think <laughs> I can read this. <laughs> this is this is the first letter that I received, and it actually is in the book in the tough stuff chapter, which is the chapter about handling difficult things as a black girl. Good evening, darling. I write this letter from a hotel room in Houston, Texas, a long way away from my small apartment on Halstead Street in East Orange, New Jersey. I don't think even as a child, I imagined a world bigger than that town full of hopeful hopelessness. I couldn't see past the concrete or crack needles that line the path to where I now find myself today. But here I am, writing to you, my darling. I am writing you, wishing you well in a time that may seem to be anything other to little girls who look like you, that look like us. I write you without knowing your story or your path, so perhaps I should share my own. I was the young flower that bloomed from the broken glass and concrete of the hood, the daughter of a genius welder and en engineer turned crack addict. He died before I could appreciate his brilliance. I am the child of two parents infected with HIV before there were medications to treat it. One died, the other is still here, although forever changed. The daughter of a valedictorian and woman in STEM who was accepted into every Ivy League she applied to. However, the isolation of being educated in a predominantly white school took its toll and she left too soon. My mother studied biomedical engineering. I am now the vice president of strategy, leading engineers in healthcare technology, and I am owning my space to ensure your experience won't be the same. Life is complicated and nonlinear. Learn that now. There are many paths to the same destination. If you should find that plan A fails, remember to fall back on the rest of your alphabet. I was a high school dropout, but plan to soon begin my doctorate in learning technologies. Sometimes it's hard to catch my breath and take this journey in because there was a time that I thought that only people who held doctors, the doctor's title were physicians, but in a few years, I'll be one. I am now one of 125 women chosen by the largest scientific organization in the United States to nationally represent women in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. As an if-then ambassador, and in a few short months, a life-size statue of myself and 119 other incredible women will be on display, and I will be thinking of you during its unveiling. When you are low and feeling down and your body and energy are weary, Remember these words, pull from me all the positive energy I hold for you here in my heart as I type these words. Remember that within those veins, carry the legacy of a dozen generations waiting for you to arrive to your own occasion. Do not fear your own brilliance and beauty. Do not hide it or dim your light because others complain of the glare. If you feel like you are bigger than something, that's because you are. I wish I would have written you from the beaches of St. Lucia or from the waters of Loch Ness in Scotland. I wish I could have taken notes during my commute to work in Silicon Valley or during lunch breaks while looking out on the bay in San Francisco. I wish you could walk with me through the buildings of Houston Community College as I work with the brilliant minds of the most diverse city in the nation to tackle the issue of flooding and climate change with technology. We should have been pen pals a long time ago. I'm sure there would have been much to discuss, but know that you were there with me. Know that you are here with me. Know that you will be there for every keynote address at every given tech conference. You will be there for every new concept or application I create. For every new breakthrough, every algorithm, every data model created, you will be on my mind as I research while pursuing my doctorate to understand how you think and learn so someday someone can teach your children 
better than others have taught you. Know that you are not alone. You are not invisible. I see you. You are capable. You are powerful. You are worthy. You are part of a larger community. And with us, you are home. As Black women, we are not the exception. We are the norm. And I will wait for you. We will wait for you. I will build an infrastructure for you and keep the path lit on your journey so you'll never have to worry about finding your way again. In moments when life seems most uncertain and you are most afraid of your future, think of the caterpillar who did not know that when it saw a butterfly flying above, it too would become one. You are part of something bigger, so accept the uneasiness in your gut when you desire more and trust it and then rise to your own occasion and you will be met with equal company. Love, Nicole. I love that. That was beautiful. Was. I held it together. That one always makes me ugly cry. Yeah. I, was like, <laughs> I heard a few little cracks. I was like, uh oh. Like, yeah. <laughs> Look, I would read that every day just to get your day going and get you. Yeah. I know it gets me hyped up. Yeah. Drop that link. Yeah. I will. So we can go ahead and pre order that. We'd love to support. And then the other thing. Kind of circling back. Um, so last month we had Disha on to talk about her book and she mentioned you and we, I knew that you guys were friends but then reading your book I didn't realize that she was in the book like a couple of times and I was like oh look at that like it's just funny how everything came full circle like I, you guys knew each other but I didn't know the extent and I'm like oh, okay so y'all like really really know each other like she also has an awesome letter in this book too oh that's awesome <laughs> Yeah, she's she's become my new my new favorite. Um, yeah. my clubhouse buddy too. I, we yeah. do a lot of clubhouse chats lately with her. And what are you on clubhouse? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes, add yes. We'll need to follow each other and yeah. pick one that. Um, what was it? It was petty divorce shit. Was the name of the room that she created. And it was just, <laughs> the guys that she had in there and the women like the stories. It was just hilarious and she's just been awesome and so that was very cool to like read your book and and see her name in that a few times so that was really cool to see that Isha is my girl I am so happy for her I got a chance to read Maybe. a lot of those stories before they ever made it to book form and I kept telling her you know how you gas your girl I was like girl this is the book I'm telling you. Yes. So I've been telling her over the last several months. I told you. I told right. you, girl. <laughs> yeah, that peach cobbler still sticks with me. Yes. I can't, I can't shake that story. It's just, you know, usually when I read something, I just kind of forget because I read so much. It's just gone. But that right there, that book stuck with me. And so, yeah, very exciting. But thank you so much for, for being with us tonight and, and discussing your book with us and we are so looking forward to everything that you have coming um this year we're excited for that so yeah we'll definitely be pre-ordering it up to support you and yeah if anybody else has any final words but thank you so much for being here with us tonight thank, thank you for having thank me. you thank you for supporting my work no problem. i hope you'll keep in touch tamara winfrey harris.com is my website I hope you'll follow me and we can become social media friends. And yes. I just next. followed you on Clubhouse. Look, I'm about to find you next. Look, <laughs> that's my next. I'm about to go on there <laughs> and, and do it. Yeah. Follow you on there because we have a lot of fun on there. Shenanigans. I can't wait. Yeah. Disha's gotten us addicted. I think she gave Tracy from the stack, she gave her like a welcome party, but she was giving us all like this tutorial because we were all like a couple days in. Uh -huh. This is what you do. And this is how you refresh your picture. And this is how you refresh the And I'm like, oh my gosh, there's so much to this that I just, <laughs> I did not know. So she's, she's just been awesome. So very exciting. Um, but thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining thank us tonight. You. It's been awesome, as usual. Love seeing your faces. And, um, yeah, I guess we will see you guys next time. Be safe. Bye, yes. well. Bye. Happy New Year, everyone. Bye. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year.
It's great meeting you all. Have a yeah. great one. Same. Come back. I yes, next will month. enjoy. <laughs> yeah, if you have, I don't know if you're in our Facebook group. Yes. Or did you, okay, I was going to say that's where activity happens. <laughs> <laughs> gifts. <laughs> all the gifts in the comments. Yes, yes my gifts. <laughs> Hey, I don't like those gifts. I don't want you to post anymore. <laughs> There's a delete and block button in that group. I'll just... <laughs> no more gifts. Healy, you post them too. <laughs> Look, right. Well, yeah, we're the main one. We all do them to each other. So, right. you, you saw me before you got halfway through the story. I was like, deuces. He can right. go. She did. Just bye. <laughs> If anybody knows anything about me, like social media is my passion. Like I literally do that for a living every single day. I get paid to do gosh, that. Oh my gosh. That it's like you're telling me to off my right arm. I never use it again. I just, I don't understand. Anywho. <laughs> <laughs> Enough of that. We'll see y'all later. Happy New Year. Bye. 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 Have a great one.